I would also like to welcome everyone. And I think since I've got a very nice introduction from Charles, uh, without further ado, let's jump right in. My thesis is about reusing text. Well, every, I think everyone in Germany, and maybe also in the rest of the world, is, is, knows this symbol. It stands for reuse. To reuse means to use something again after the first time. And, well, I'm not, uh, my, my thesis is not about reuse in general, but about reusing text. What is that? This may be called reusing text. I reused a lot of letters to build this little graphic, but uh, no, it's, it's actually just a job. Uh, uh, there are many well-known forms of reuse, and they are ubiquitous. We reuse text as a matter of course. And these are the forms of reuse which can be grouped under this term. First of all, there are quotations. We use quotations in science all the time. Um, there is boilerplate text. Boilerplate text can be found in user license agreements of software. Boilerplate text can be found in legal documents. Boilerplate text can be found uh, uh, more or less in privacy notices everywhere on the web. Um, then, uh, very famous of course, there are translations. Translations happen all the time. We usually translate text from English to another language uh, since uh, uh, most texts on the web are written in English. but not, not, uh, most web users do not understand English very well. So finally, there's some, there are summarizations. We have done a lot of summarizations in school, and summaries uh, uh, are uh, often done in order, to, in order to give a quick overview about a, a big body of work. Translations further divide into the so-called metaphrase and paraphrase. I will not go into detail about these two. There's one famous item missing from this list. You may already guess it, it's very famous in Germany as of recent and it's called plagiarism. Um, well, plagiarism has a special role in this uh, uh, taxonomy. Plagiarism is a form of text reuse, but it turns out all other forms of text reuse I just introduced can be plagiarism under the right circumstances. This is why plagiarism is placed on top and has a connection to all the other forms of text reuse as well. I have developed technologies that deal with all, many, not all, many of these kinds of text reuse. And my contributions, I have listed them on this slide. You don't need to read all of that. Um, I have organized them for you in five fields. These fields are first models and algorithms, Second, research service, where I uh, uh, give an overview of the state of the art in a particular topic. Uh, there are evaluation resources as a, on the third place. Evaluation resources are very important in order to do standardized evaluations of models and algorithms. I have, of course, done a lot of experiments which, uh, uh, which compare many different models and algorithms. And finally, I've also went, I also went an extra uh, uh, way in order to uh, um, compile these technologies into usable tools, which are listed down below. Now, I won't present you all of them. It would take me hours to do that. I will just present you a selection of three technologies. The first one is about detecting cross-language text reuse. Now, as a start, consider these two texts. Both of these texts talk about the childhood and youth of Alan Turing, a famous computer scientist. Both texts, in this case, are written in English. They have the exact same topic. We know that because we can read them and understand this. Um, for an information retrieval scientist, we want to teach a computer to uh, uh, quantify the topic similarity of these two texts uh, as a real value. How can we do that? Well, the first idea to do that, and this is usually what is uh, done in research, is to look at overlapping words. I've highlighted them here for you. There are many overlapping words uh, between these two texts, and uh, these overlaps are computed and then compiled into uh, this, these structures. We simply count all the words appearing in the two documents and represent them as vectors. Um, as you can see, 
The word Turing appears four times in this document, five times in this document. The word army once here and once here. And uh, so, so, so the list goes on for all the other words which appear in these two documents. Now, since we interpret these structures as vectors, we can treat them with standard vector mathematics. And uh, we can compute similarities of vectors by computing the Euclidean distance, by computing the scalar product of the vectors, or by computing the cosine similarity. The latter is most, most usually used in information retrieval. What we get is a value between 0 and 1, where 0 denotes absolutely no uh, similarity between the two documents, and 1 denotes a maximum similarity, whatever that means. So, a perfect overlap of words. Now, going on, consider these two documents. One is written in English, the same as before, but one is still about, uh, uh, one is written in German, but still about the topic Alan Turing, and also about his childhood and youth. If we again highlight the overlapping words, you'd notice there are much fewer words which overlap. And if you look closely at them, there are only named entities like people, places, or times. If we again compute these uh, vectors out of them and try to uh, compute the similarities of these two vectors, we will notice that the similarity values we will get are much, are much less usable, much less reliable in practice, because we cannot rely on named entities appearing between two texts of different languages. Actually, if we do rely on that, we rely on syntactic overlap. Um, if we have, for instance, a Chinese document on the right, there would be no syntactic overlap whatsoever. Well, how can we deal with that? Well, a usual solution to that is to translate one of the documents into the other language. And translation uh, should also be done automatically because we want to teach a computer to do this. Uh, the problem is that automatic translation is still a, an unsolved problem. There are big companies attempting to do that, yet uh, um, um, for a single researcher to, to, to accomplish an automatic machine translation, to, to build a machine translation system is still a very, uh, a very um, difficult task. There are a, a lot of resources needed which are not readily available and um, there's a lot of ambiguity in the translations afterwards, so they are still not perfectly reliable. You all know that if you use Google Translate. Now, what can we do? I have come up with a model which solves this problem by taking a detour. The model is called cross-language explicit semantic analysis. And uh, the name is derived from a model uh, 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 from which the idea stems. Yet, uh, there's, there's a con the contribution of my model is that it also no works now across languages, which the previous model didn't. Now, what do we need extra? We need two document collections. These two document collections have to come from the, exact, from the languages of the original documents. Now, these documents collections can be small or big, can be sized up to, up to 100,000 documents, and they have to have a special property. For each document appearing in this collection, there must be a paired up document which, has the same, which talks about the same topic. So, where can we find these documents? <coughs> Wikipedia is a very good source for this, and I'll give you a quick example. Uh, there are the two uh, uh, Wikipedia articles about reuse and, in German, Wiederverwendung. They are the same concepts, they talk about it exhaustively, and they are linked across languages. And it is these links we uh, exploit in order to build these collections. Most importantly, these articles are not translations of each other. They are written independently by the crowd. This is why these, this, the, uh, obtaining these collections is much easier than obtaining translations of a lot of texts. The next step in my model is to actually represent these documents in the collection just as we do above. After that, we compute independently the similarities of, these, of this vector to each individual vector in the collection, obtaining 
a number of similarity values which we again organize into a vector. We do that for the German language as well. And by this construction, by representing this document as this vector, which spans, which, which is uh, 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 positioned in a vector space, which is uh, spanned by the concepts of Wikipedia articles, we can compare them across languages with less problems. Actually, we have done quite a number of experiments on this, and I will give you, I can only give you a very brief overview. Um, we have done six experiments to test our model out. Um, for instance, we have tried to rank uh, uh, documents across languages. We have tried to uh, uh, compute a correlation of uh, 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 the, this model to another doc document model which works robustly and see how well it does. Um, we have done another, uh, uh, another, four, uh, six, another four experiments, so it is a total of six. We have done these experiments with two other state-of-the-art models using two test collections and on six different pairs of languages. Uh, all in all, computing more than 100 million uh, similarities with these models. I will show you just some of the results. And one of the experiments we did, we wanted to uh, I, I will, sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to explain all these graphs, it, it would be too, it would take too long. But I want to show you just one feature of these graphs. Um, one experiment was to test out how big does, does the uh, dimensionality, that is the size of the collection uh, uh, we use in each individual language, have to be. We have started with 10 documents and gone all the way up to 100,000 documents. As you can see in this graph, up means a uh, 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 graph which is closer to the top line uh, is better. Uh, the quality of the, this is actually a ranking experiment, the quality of the ranking goes up, goes up until it is nearly perfect. Um, this is just one experiment we did. As I said, we did a lot more and uh, I, it would take really too long to go into detail about everything. This concludes this part of the talk. The next part is about evaluating plagiarism detectors. Well, plagiarism is, as I said, in Germany very famous at the moment, much discussed topic. And again, our starting point is two documents. Um, don't bother to read them. They still say something about Alan Turing. And I have constructed these two documents in a way so that they contain an actual case of plagiarism, which is highlighted here. I have lifted this passage, put it into this document, and modified it. Modifying uh, plagiarized text is, an often, is often done by, by a plagiarist. So in order to not to be uh, detectable that easy. This is how we uh, 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 how we notate these kinds of plagiarism cases. We uh, 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 put them as a four tuple where this is the plagiarized passage, this is the source passage, and there are two references to the respective documents. Now, let us pretend a plagiarism detector has detected, uh, has analyzed these two documents and then come up with a detection, which, is, which you can see here in blue. It is notated quite similarly, but most obviously there is overlap to the uh, actual plagiarism case, but not entirely. It didn't find everything. Actually, it found more than it was supposed to find. And the big question now is, is this good or is this bad? What is the quality? How can we quantify this quality? How can we compute a value for that in order to say it's good or it's bad? Um, as part of my research, I have come up with formulas to do that. And these are performance measure, measures, which, are, you, which can be used to evaluate plagiarism detectors. Let us focus now on this case and this notation. The first most important thing in such kind of plagiarism cases is that uh, they have to fulfill, uh, a detection has to fulfill a constraint in order to truly detect a plagiarism case. The constraint, we say that R detects S, 
if and only if there is overlap on both sides, the plagiarized document and the source documents. The overlap need not be more than one character in the extreme case, but it has to be there. Now, we define a certain uh, uh, notation and uh, assign a meaning to it. This is actually taking a shortcut of the actual formalization I, I took, but it it's works for this example. So, we, we, we quantify the overlap of S and R as the number of overlapping characters, but only if it is a true detection. Otherwise, it's zero. Now we can compute two well-known and important uh, quality measures, which are called precision and recall of the detection. Precision simply divides uh, uh, the, overlapping the number of overlapping char characters by the length of the detection. So, um, precision computes, or more, more abstract, precision computes if everything what has been detected should have been detected. Recall, on the other hand, divides the number of overlapping characters by the, length, by the total length of the detection on both sides. Recall computes if everything uh, that has been detected, no, I'm sorry. Recall computes if everything that should have been detected has been detected. Now, these two measures are well known in information material and very often used. And this was our intuition to uh, compute the uh, uh, quality of a plagiarism detection. But when we look close at the problem, we saw that there are many more different patterns which might appear in detections. And I've, I've listed the patterns here, the basic patterns we can, we can see. We can, we, have, we can have exact detections. We can have a non-detection, which means something was detected, but there is nothing. Or we can have plagiarism cases, cases which haven't been detected. This is the case we just saw. These, are, uh, these two are uh, uh, kind of similar, but with uh, more extreme overlaps. Um, most interestingly, there are the, these last three cases. And from these three patterns, which we observed with real plagiarism detectors, um, we have derived the following uh, uh, conclusions. We cannot assume, in, in, uh, when, when developing a performance measure, we cannot assume a one-to-one -one correspondence between plagiarism cases. You can see it here. Uh, this is a long plagiarism case, but it has been detected many times over. On the other hand, this is a long detection, but which, which detects many different plagiarism cases. So, the measures have to deal with sets of detections and sets of plagiarism cases. Finally, we have to avoid double counting of detected characters in our measures, if we deal with sets of them, simply because there may be detections which overlap to some extent. So, in the end, the measures turned out to be a little bit more complicated, but you can still see the original pattern here. We have represented the plagiarism case and the detection differently as sets of particular items of which we take the union here and then we compute an average for both precision and recall. There's, in, in the thesis you will find even more variation by using different uh, kinds of averaging. Like this is macro average, but in the thesis it is micro average. This is just for an additional detail. Now, this is all good and fine. But do they work? Do they, make, do they compute some sensible values? And um, we, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I skipped ahead. It was true, this is not the end of the story. Um, let us, we, 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 have, we have seen uh, uh, another problem which has to be measured, which is not accounted for by precision and recall. Let us focus on the original plagiarism case and on a new kind of detection. This looks somewhat different from the detection before. It is fragmented somehow. So in this case, the computer just, um, uh, the, de the detector just returned the longest common substring of these two, the lo all longest common substrings, not the longest common substrings, all longest common substrings of these two um, uh, strings. Now, this is an undesirable effect in a plagiarism detector. If you, if you can see a very long plagiarism case, uh, if you can imagine a very long plagiarism case, and you get all these little overlaps, 
the human user is left to combine all of this into a coherent case. And if you, if you uh, as a consequence of identifying plagiarism, you want to expel someone from school or something like that, you have to make a strong case. And if you use a tool like a plagiarism detector, it has to support you well. So what we want from a plagiarism detector is to detect this plagiarism case as a whole and not just in little parts. This is, uh, uh, this property is measured by measure what we, uh, what we call granularity. So what we actually measure is, uh, the formula is, uh, uh, looks more difficult than it actually is, we actually just measure the average number of times a plagiarism case gets detected. So in this particular example, it's five. This is about a granularity. So we have introduced a new measure here, which has to be combined with precision and recall. We've got three measures now, precision, recall, and granularity. Having three measures to judge a plagiarism detection algorithm is kind of difficult because one algorithm can be good in precision, bad in recall, good in granularity. But there may be another algorithm which is bad in precision, good in recall, and bad in granularity. Um, which one is better now? These three measures allow only for partial order of plagiarism detection algorithms. And in order to obtain, uh, 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 in order to obtain a uh, complete order, and, and, yeah, uh, I don't know, I don't actually know what's the, oh, sorry? a total order. Thank you. Uh, in order to obtain a total order of plagiarism detection algorithms, um, we have to combine these values into one single score. And this is accomplished by the, what we call the plug dead score. Um, what we do is we, we first compute the harmonic mean of precision at recall, which is usually, usually done in information retrieval. And the second thing we do is uh, we divide this by the uh, uh, logarithm of the granularity. The granularity has the domain one to the number of uh, 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 plagiarism cases, which are in one set of plagiarism cases, uh, uh, no. The granularity has the domain of one to the size of the number of detections. So this is why we take the logarithm of it. We, we don't want to, uh, we have noticed that plagiarism detectors usually have a granularity bigger than one and even, sometimes even bigger than two, but we don't want to, the measure to uh, become, the F measure of precision we call to become too small. What you want from, a, from an evaluation measure is to uh, uh, spread the algorithms more or less evenly, uh, uh, as even as possible across the, uh, uh, across the domain. So if all the uh, 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 algorithms would be evaluated to some value between 0 and 0 0.1, this would not tell very much, it would look awkward. But you can of course uh, uh, apply weighting in order to circumvent that. However, uh, uh, if a measure works right away, this is better. But this is still a very open discussion of how to actually weight each measure into this, uh, 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 into this overall score. Since we, had since we don't have data on anything, on any real plagiarism cases, except for the ones which have been recently uncovered and spread over the internet, which is still a very low scale, uh, we cannot actually tell which, which measure is more important. This is why we have, uh, 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 we, we have settled on a very even uh, 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 weighting of each of the methods in the overall score. Now I come back to where I skipped, at, skipped ahead uh, earlier. Um, this is all good and fine. We have now four measures in total. And uh, do they work? Do they, do they somehow tell us whether uh, 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 a plagiarism detection algorithm is good or not? Um, we, have, we have developed these measures um, while we were conducting an evaluation competition about plagiarism detection. Um, the PAN workshop has been organized since 2007 and as of 2009 we have started to organize competitions about plagiarism detection. And we have done so for the past three years. And there we have employed the measures and a newly developed evaluation framework consisting of a corpus as well, uh, a corpus of uh, very many plagiarism cases. And, uh, I will show you just an overview of the results. Uh, we had many participants over the time, more than 30 have took part, 
and sometimes some of the participants more than once. And uh, these are the results we got for the four measures. Well, as you can see, the, uh, there are some who perform good, some who perform bad, and this is to be expected. And mo most importantly, the newly introduced measure granularity. In the first year, nobody cared about it, apparently. Only the top three participants who then ended up with very good scores. Um, but in the second and third year, people spent a lot more uh, 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 time getting the granularity down to a value close to one. This concludes this part of the talk. In my next and third and last part of the talk for today, I will describe a new tool which we have developed for reusing the web to assist writers. The tool is called NetSpeak. And let's start with a quick example. Um, if you want to write looks good, Mm -hmm. Me. Which preposition would you take? Um, I mean, the answer is already given away. These numbers have to account for something. Um, these numbers, this, actually this is a query which you can post to our search engine, which we have developed. It is a wildcard query, and this uh, stands for exactly one word. And NetSpeak finds all the phrases which, con which contain all the words plus uh, uh, it finds all the words which may go in place of the uh, question mark. In addition to this information, you will get um, the number of occurrences of this, of this phrase in a very large corpus of the, uh, uh, the web, in a very large subsection of the web. And from these numbers you can now decide how common it is to write something like this. What you cannot decide is how correct it is. Something which is incorrect may be more common than something which is correct. Still, what can be expected is that the more common expressions are more frequent on the web. This does not just work for, ex uh, for um, uh, propositions. You can replace all the other words as well. You can pose, uh, you can pose many different kinds of queries. And, um, here are some of the technical details. I mean, we didn't just develop the uh, tool, which is simply, simply put, a wildcard query processor on top of a lot of these phrases plus the accounts. Um, we did so at scale, and we also come up with some new, uh, some new retrieval algorithms, with a new retrieval algorithm to retrieve these uh, uh, phrases in a quick time, meaning at each query gets, on average, uh, answered less than a second. The number of phrases has to be big in such a tool in order to cover as wide, uh, as many topics as possible. So uh, we have used uh, three billion phrases which have been obtained from the web and as well as their counts. Uh, this corpus was made available to us by Google. It's not made available to us, uh, uh, only to us, it is available to all research. The index uh, is currently more than 120 gigabytes, and as I said, in less than a second's time, each query is answered. Um, since the tool was uh, uh, first put online sometime in mid-2008, I think, uh, uh, until now it has uh, 4,300 4, users per month. We have published about this tool, and um, um, some of the work which has been derived from this uh, uh, is an award-winning paper at an information visualization conference, um, we, uh, which, was work, which was done in collaboration with another group from Bowles, at, at Bowles University. So, at last, long last, we can get the appreciation for our writing we need. <laughs> this concludes my talk. I've showed you three, that is four, of the topics listed here. And um, there's much more to be found in my thesis. There's only one last thing for me to say. I've worked together and collaborated with a great many people here in the last five and a half years. All of them are listed here. At least I hope I, I didn't forget anyone. And uh, uh, simply put, thank you.